Hello, everyone. Welcome again to another episode of The Raw Men. This is episode number 47, and this time we're talking to Dennis Deal. He's a former pastor, now out with the Clergy Project, and speaking out against abusive personality cults like the Worldwide Church of God and the Restored Church of God. How do you do, sir? Good morning. Good to see you. Oh, thank you so much. Now, how do you... I don't know where to start this story. I mean, I, I'm very passionate about uh, uh, deconversion stories, so maybe mm -hmm. that would be good. But I think in this case, maybe you've got some more background before that that we need to get into. Well, I grew up uh, grew up Presbyterian, and I became enamored with the uh, Worldwide Church of God when I was about 14. But I had a conflict uh, between the good science that I liked. That was very typical, you know, dinosaurs and evolution and so on and the church seemed to offer a good balance between what i thought the bible you know being literally true and the answers to some of those questions of course that later proved to be um incompatible with uh, not only those churches but with really any church mm -hmm. so i went to the college um became a church pastor um was sent out uh, into the ministry in 1972 and um, subsequently ended up pastoring in 14 different congregations, five different states um, for the church. And then, then uh, the church, because it was a one-man show, Herbert Armstrong at the time, Garner Ted Armstrong, very popular radio speaker, um, you know, it was, was run in the typical manner of if they don't believe it, if they don't understand it, you can't bring information to them. They, never learned anything new, as far as I could ever tell. They really weren't well-trained in theology. They were what I call mere Bible readers. You read it, you comment on it, you formulate your theology from it. And then, of course, they ran it with their personalities. And so, um, as the years went on, there was scandal of all different kinds uh, with different people. And uh, ultimately, the whole thing just began to come apart. Back about in the mid-90s, the successor to uh, Herbert Armstrong, Joseph de Koch, um, basically flipped the church, which was basically a Jewish Christian practice. Uh, as a church, they kept the Sabbath on Saturday, um, did not keep Christmas, Easter, all of the traditional Christian holidays, uh, because they labeled them as pagan and uh, kept more what they saw in the Bible as Passover uh, and the Jewish holy days, but with a Christian twist, you know, with Jesus and Christ and the second coming and, and all of that. It's still a, quite a movement today. Um, it the, is a little different in that they don't hold all of the, uh, all of the traditional beliefs. I mean, yeah, like you were saying, honoring the Jewish holidays, but also, as I understand it, they're not Trinitarian. Exactly. Right. Now that came later when, you see, when they changed to the, the new people that came in to take over, you know, saw their own light, I think reinvented the wheel and basically took me back to being Presbyterian. Um, but in an organization that's run, you know, by one individual like that for so many decades, uh, to make such a dramatic change, which most churches in history do over hundreds of years, they did it in, in a year and lost most of their membership, most of their funding, and ultimately had to close down, sell the college campus, turn it into condos, and from that sprang over 300 uh, splinter groups, all of which are claiming to be the true representation of what it used to be. It's, it's quite a circus, and I'm glad it's not my monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> so the group that we're talking about includes the, uh, the Restored Church of God and, and David C. Pack, the people that I've, the guy that I've been uh, uh, blasting in, in a recent <laughs> series of mine. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is what, what connection do you have with that group? Um, well, just the fact that uh, I know uh, Mr. Peck personally. I went to college with him. Uh, he was a pastor uh, in my parents' church in New York. Uh, he has a, a, a quite a reputation for being abusive um, to people. It's you know kind of a long story, but um, he basically has started his own splinter group, and he claims, you know, to be the one who is accurately representing what Herbert Armstrong stood for. And so he has adopted many titles to himself. He calls himself an apostle. He thinks he is Joshua, the one spoken of in the book of Haggai. 
um, because she thinks Herbert Armstrong was Zerubbabel or a type of Zerubbabel. And there's a lot of that kind of talk in those churches. Um, if there's one word you'll find used very little in these splinter groups, it's the word Jesus. Um, it's <laughs> just amazing. <laughs> But they take a lot of titles to themselves and very abusive financially to their members. Um, Dave Pack is probably the um, biggest example of that. Selling your homes, sending him the money. Um, that could, you know, quote him. Uh, if a woman is in the church, she gets to say what happens to the money and sell the house because it's, she's in the church. If she's not in the church, well, then the man can tell the woman she's not in the church and he gets to give the money to the church. Um, it's quite a show. It's quite so, a show. However, it's dangerous. I was under the impression from some peripheral videos that I've seen from other people in that, that were involved in that church mm -hmm. that, uh, that PAC uh, more or less extorts labor out of these people and, and, and essentially owns the community, not just the building itself, but, but the, the, the surrounding community such that one, one guy was saying in his video that at some point he gathered a few belongings and snuck out of the community in the middle of the night so that he could escape that church. Yeah, well, I, I would totally believe that. I, I know personally members, um, you know, that uh, have lost their businesses, you know, had, had the money from their business taken, promised, you know. Dave never held on to an office staff more than a year <laughs> um, once they see what's going on on the inside. Um, he has rebuilt the college campus, uh, the original college was called Ambassador College in Pasadena, California, and he is mimicking that campus, building it in Wadsworth, Ohio, uh, because again, he thinks he's restoring, that's why he calls himself the Restored Church of God, restoring everything that used to be. You know, uh, I think Dave just likes to live in the past, those were the good old days to him. He's recreating it, but he's doing it on the backs of people who should know better, and they simply can't let him go. Um, he has a certain charisma, as many of these cultic leaders do, um, but it's to their harm. And when they see it, it's dramatic, and they leave. When they don't see it, you can't, you can't convince them. Okay. Well, if, if he has a certain charisma, then I'm only going to have to be, I'm only going to have to take your word for it because I certainly haven't seen evidence of that myself. Well, <laughs> well, uh, maybe, maybe I mean intimidation. Okay, perhaps. Yeah, perhaps because he does seem to be very he's very bossy he's very commanding and you exactly. uh, I talk and you listen and you know, oh yeah I, I'm, <laughs> well, I'm sure there are people that that succumb to that that are susceptible to that kind of a personality yeah well that's very true I was just talking to my sister the other day uh, who he pastored and she reminded me of um, uh, he was deciding whether he wanted to ordain my brother-in-law and asked him um, how he would discipline his daughter who was crying during one of his sermons and he attributes that to Satan trying to interfere with what he has to say and my brother-in-law said well we usually sit down and we talk and I hold her on my lap and I kind of rub her back and we work it out and he said no you should spank her you need to spank that out of her and because of that he wouldn't ordain him uh, so that's the kind of intimidating uh, personality that he has and um, you know there's a lot of stories about that even in his own family uh, with his own children no well, this is not a, not a huge surprise to me because and we we've heard so many things you know, for so many different pastors that right. have that kind of command over their their congregation or cult or if we want to call it that, mm -hmm. that there's all there's many times you find out that they have internal abuses going on in the home too. I mean, like Creflo Dollar was arrested for abusing his own daughter, for example. Yes, yes. Well, that, that same charge was um, made against Herbert Armstrong uh, back years ago, and it's evidently true. You know, it was uh, so much going on behind the scenes, and I, I consider, in hindsight, I consider myself incredibly naive you know, I was believing for the best. It seemed right to me. The theology seemed right to me because there was so much Bible reading. Mm -hmm. But as I grew older and studied more, I realized the contradictions, the bad history. And, and I've always been intrigued with evolution, which I firmly believe. And so um, it, it all fell apart for me. I, I just simply some, couldn't. Can you elaborate a bit on Because as I told you, I, I like deconversion stories. I like, I like hearing what it was that changed your mind because... That's, it's always different. Right. Well, what, um, 
Yeah, I'm a, I consider myself a student, a reader. I don't stay in the box, you know, that I came in. I didn't grow up that way. Presbyterians are pretty open-minded. So through the years as a pastor, you know, I read outside of the church. It surprised me, but most of the ministry of the church doesn't read outside of the church. Um, you know, Dave Pack never read a book, from what I can understand, that he didn't write. And so... Um, as I say, I've always liked evolution, science, and so I kept reading, studying, and concluding, first of all, that the Bible's not literally true. You know, my, my first experience with, with the birth stories of Jesus, why are they different? Uh, where did they come from? Most of, them are, uh, most of it's concocted from Old Testament scriptures, and, which simply says nobody knows how Jesus was born, so here's the story. And it's obvious Luke never read Matthew. Um, and that they were also injected into the text, uh, probably to answer the question, you know, we weren't born of fornication. So um, all of those things added up, and I began to realize how much outside of the box I was thinking. And there were sermons I no longer wanted to give. There were topics I no longer wanted to cover. Uh, and it took maybe a decade to lose my confidence, not only in the church for all of its shenanigans, but in the Bible, uh, very much like... Uh, Dan Barker, who wrote a book called uh, um, Losing Faith in Faith. It's exactly what happened. I lost faith in faith, and in some of my writings kind of expressed it by saying, you know, faith is what you have until the facts destroy it. And that's basically my story. Um, I outgrew the church. I would have anyway. I'd been accepted to another seminary before I went to Ambassador College, a Methodist one. And I'm pretty convinced I would have had the same crisis of faith and belief uh, with different players. Now, well, at, least, at least with the Methodists, you'd still have a job. Because I understand that, I mean, there, in Austin, we have a Methodist church where the pastor is an open non-theist. He doesn't call himself atheist, but he's mm -hmm. a non-theist. And he's still, he's still a Methodist pastor. Yeah, I have, I can't tell you how many ministers that I've talked to, you know, when I say, when I've had other jobs, you know, and they say, well, what did you used to do? And they find out I'm a pastor, or if I talk to church pastors um, privately, you know, like we're talking, um, they'll, they'll all say, you know, um, yeah, I know you're right. I know that's true. Um, I've studied that. I've learned that in seminary, but you can't say that in church. I'll lose my job. I, I've met Episcopal priests who consider themselves Buddhists and drive Mercedes and do very, very well and give gospel, you know, sermons that they're supposed to give, but they don't believe it. And, and I don't think people believe that they could have a pastor who teaches them one thing and yet doesn't believe it. I, I've seen it over and over and over privately. Well, it, there's kind of a double irony if you're going to, if you're going to be this, uh, cast yourself as an evangelical preacher, but then uh, but then say that you're a Buddhist and drive the Mercedes because isn't Buddhism supposed to be renunciated? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he didn't look too renunciated. <laughs> I think it was probably the wealthiest church in town. <laughs> okay, well, you you said a little bit earlier that there was you know there was there was some scandal. We can come back to that uh, if uh -huh. if you like. Um, um, and I want to know. You said you were with the clergy project. I'd like to hear about how you got involved with that and how how that affected your life. Uh, just just any of that. Where do we go from here? Well, you know, the clergy project uh, really hit at a good time, you know, in my own life because, uh, and that started by Dan Barker again, who, who wrote um, Losing Faith in Faith. And um, that's a project where they're finding many church pastors are coming to the same conclusions, you know, about their churches, about the Bible. Many of them stay in it. They come to those conclusions and they stay in it. I won't say just for the paycheck. I know how that is. I never did it for the paycheck. I did it because I was sincere and I thought things would work out. But um, um, many pastors can't abide it. They can't say one thing and mean another. And so they come out of a ministry. But coming out of a ministry, it's not like leaving IBM. Um, you lose most of your friends. There's a good chance you're going to get divorced. You're going to confuse your children. You're going to instantly not have an income. And it's not easy to go from a church pastor to anything else. Um, 
because you probably spent half of your life doing that and you got a lot of years behind you you know you're not a kid anymore so uh, one of the things that I've been uh, sort of accused of through the years by some of the members or ex-members is well how long did you know that you didn't believe the church and why did you take a paycheck and I've been through all of that you know and I say well you know you can work for IBM not like your boss or agree what they're doing and you still don't quit uh, maybe hoping it'll work out. So uh, the clergy so they're project. they criticize you for the hypocrisy of yeah. of, of of taking that lo that long time to figure out what it. And and this is a long time for everybody. I mean, Ricky Gervais is probably the only person that ever had a momentary conversion from believer to non-believer. Everybody else, it's a series of stages where you know it's a it's a long period of acceptance. And so you know you've got the the people that are the hypocrites that are still in their offices, the ones who call themselves. Buddhists and so forth, and they, they, they don't believe what they're selling. And we know that there are many preachers out there that clearly do not buy their own bullshit. Absolutely. Right? I mean, so, so who is the hypocrite? The guy who says, I can't do this anymore because it's, it's dishonest, or the guy who doesn't have any problem with continuing? Right, right. Well, what the, what the reasoning is, is the mo they think the moment you have a doubt about your faith, then you should not be paid. You know, you should have the guts to quit. It, like you say, it doesn't work that way. I'd say it took me 10 years. I, I was wrestling with the scandal in the church and all of the, uh, you know, come on, guys, you know, start behaving yourselves. Be long before the Bible issues came up. Then when the Bible issues came up, it was, you know, another four or five years of, can this be true, you know? And then you begin to wonder, I mean, what is religion? My understanding of why I came into religion the way I did, and I think most people do, is because the bottom line is we're all afraid of dying. What's going to happen to me? So when you leave that, when you think you knew the answer to that, and you felt good about it, and you can read it in, in the Bible, um, and then you kind of see that's not the way it is, and that's not really a true story, um, that's disconcerting, if not a little frightening, because you still wonder, well, now what's going to happen to me? And now this is a this is a problem that I have as as far as uh, connecting with other people. Is it uh, remarkably I never had the fear of death. Uh, I don't anymore. Yeah, I don't. Now I'm not saying I don't have a fear of dying. You know, right? We, we all have to go eventually. And I know a few people that went peacefully in their sleep with family and loved ones around them, and they knew it was going to happen, and they prepared for it, and it was all and it was all good. There's a beautiful way to go, and that was it. I think. Right. But. I mean, most of us uh, don't, don't get that option because there's horrible ways to go to and there's yeah, long I, of suffering. And, <laughs> and it, importantly, importantly, while religion will promise that you know you will never die, right? No religion saves you from the dying part. That's exactly right. You know, because yeah, you may, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. You may still be found, you found yourself lying on the floor, clutching your chest, gasping for that last breath. Jesus ain't saving you from that bit. It's the part that happens no. after that. And the after that part, that doesn't matter. Right. And, and I understand that people have had a great fear with this. They explain this to me, that they have this fear about the the, the abyss or or of, of simply not existing. And I said, well, have you ever had surgery? It's That's like, right. Well, as soon as they turn on that anesthetic, you're gone, man. <laughs> That's it. Yep. It's not even a dream. And you don't know if it was a month or a week ago. Exactly. I mean, it's so it, yeah. there's an abs you, There's not even a nothing you can experience because it's that much nothing. Mm -hmm. So there's really literally nothing to be afraid of. Right. Well, I've seen all those agonizing deaths. You know, one of the doctrines of the church um, was just applying James 5.14, you know, if any sick among you, let him call for the elders, and the prayer of faith will make you well, and if you forgive and get sins, you'll be forgiven. And they discourage doctors, one of those cults that discourage going to the doctor, you just let God heal you. So I've, I've seen a lot of misery that did not have to happen. Um, I always sent my kids to doctors, I gave them all their shots, you know, I don't have a, a list of things I really regret having done in that area. But um, I've seen a lot of dying, and you're right. It's, it's not pretty, and nothing intervened to make it easier. And all the prayers and thoughts, as we usually send to people, I've never seen they mean anything. I've laid hands on a thousand people, thousands of people, to heal them according to what the New Testament says. Never once, never once can I say, wow, that worked. In fact, the first person I ever uh, laid my hands on to uh, apply that principle of healing was my brother. Uh, who was blind, deaf, and can't speak. 
and I was very young in the ministry, and he was the first person I thought, well, we'll see if this works. <laughs> and um, uh, it was rather funny. He looked at me. He can't talk or express himself, but he gave me that, what the hell are you doing look? <laughs> and, of course, he still can't speak. He still can't uh, hear, and he still can't see. Okay. I, yeah, I don't know what to do with that. So uh, how did you... Uh you got into you got involved in the clergy project and mm -hmm. you said that when when people do you you and i've seen this also i've seen it that all you could all you have to do is change your mind about one precept that the church teaches uh, like one case i know of you know, when somebody accepts evolution that's it they're still christian they just they just realize that you know evolution is actually a thing it really happens and mm -hmm. suddenly they're ostracized by their by their family they like you said you end up in a divorce and you're, you're fired by your employers uh, so much happens to upend your life over right. this. I mean, and, and it's not like you can change your mind and say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to believe <laughs> no. what I what I know to be true. I mean, once you know it to be true, how do you? Yeah, there's no going back. I've, ne I've met plenty of people who've come out of religion. I've only met a few people who claim, well, they've spent some time out of it, but then they rethought it and they went back to it. And I say they went back to it out of fear. Or whatever they're afraid of um, but yeah the clergy project what that would do ultimately was clergymen pastors priests women um, men and women uh, would have that experience themselves and then those are the people who would talk to those who were just coming out of it to kind of help them realize that what they're going through is normal even though it feels like hell and yeah, what one person that I know that was a that was a minister for many years told me you know, the, the, he believes in that fake it till you make it thing that, that you just need to yeah. convince yourself. It actually told me once upon a time, he says, just keep telling yourself it's Jesus until you believe it. And that's right. really his philosophy is to continue lying to himself. That's and, sad. and somebody says something that's against what you want to believe. If you don't want to believe that, well, then you just ignore that. And I, and I could actually see it happen. I could see how he would, I would start to explain things to him that are against his belief. And, and he would just sit there calmly smiling at me. And, be, and sort of turn into a mannequin. Mm -hmm. he, there's just so, obviously his brain is not working back there. The, the, there's the face; it's still there, but there's obviously he's not hearing anything. He's like chanting mantras in his head or something. So, right. Yeah, I, I don't understand this desire to prefer to believe something that you know is not really true. Right. Right. And I'm, you know, I. Again, I see hundreds and hundreds of people on the blog site that I write on in, in their comments uh, on all sorts of topics and, the, and their lack of critical thinking, their emotional thinking, their, well, it's in the Bible and I'm not giving that up, so God must have done this somehow. And so uh, they, they don't think outside the box because that will usually mean then they will be leaving their church, losing most of their friends. Uh, that's not worth it to them. And um, it's very difficult. I find it very difficult. I, I don't find many people that have ever convinced that uh, the Bible has errors in it, that it has bad history. It's certainly bad science. They, they don't believe that. They think it's good science. They think it's perfect history. Um, that's crazy. You know, that's just a crazy way to view it. But I used to view it that way, so I can't be too critical about it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, okay. So then you get with the clergy project, and then you just mentioned this blog that you do. So how did you make that transition? Well, I, I have a friend. Um, actually, it's his blog, but I'm his guest speaker because of my background. As far as I know, and as far as he knows, I'm the only former church pastor who is on his blog who writes openly under my name. Um, I had hundreds of church pastor friends. I don't know where any of them went but none of them write under their own name because they still have a certain fear of being identified with thoughts and ideas that weren't the ones they grew up with or were expected to express. Um, so I, I write on that spot and I wrote to process my own experience. I mean, that's how I got what's in my head out of my head and onto paper and onto the internet. And it, it does, it's part of my own healing to be talking to you and to be putting this all in some kind of place because it was 30 years of my life, half of my life, um, my adult life, devoted to something that to me is now just a fairy tale yeah. um, and a kind of a waste of time, you know? I could have that been was, something better. 
that that was exactly how I felt when I when I finally realized that I, I had believed what I believed because I thought there was scientific evidence to support it. And and the day that I realized that that there was no support at all for that, and there's there's literally no reason to believe that any of that is true, and and that it can't actually be true, then I had right. to reevaluate. I mean, I, I spent my entire life up to that point believing this and thinking that I had this eternal afterlife after this, when really I've only got, you know, what, at most a, a couple decades or something like that, maybe. That's right. So, yeah it, 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 yeah, it was very disappointing. And I was embarrassed in myself for having believed this way. And right, I'd always thought it was well, there's such a price to pay. There's a huge price to pay. That's a, that's a lot of time that you can't reclaim. Uh, you know, I've made peace with the fact, I like the fact that I can say to myself, well, I'm, I'm stardust, you know, I'm a hairless ape with consciousness. I like that. That doesn't bother me anymore. <laughs> so in the blog that you're doing now, <clears throat> what are you doing with that blog and how are you, how are you affecting other people with that? What is the interaction that you get? Uh, that, that particular blog probably is read mostly, almost exclusively by all the people who were a part of the Worldwide Church of God who have since splintered into, you know, 300 different places um, with different kinds of guru head ministers or uh, apostles or whatever, you know, all claiming to be the true splinter of the true church. Um, what's happening now is that there's a lot of difficulties in those splinter groups and the members who cannot speak up in church or they'll be disfellowshipped or marked, or as I say, dismembered from that church, and they don't want to be, but they speak anonymously on these sites of what they really want to say. And, and in some ways, I think that's a shame that they can't speak openly, but I know the price they'll pay, and they're not willing to pay it. So that gives the, this blog site gives them an outlet, just like the clergy project. Um, there was a code that you had to put in to even get into the clergy project. It wasn't open to anybody but the people with whom it had to do because even being found on that site would cost a man his job maybe before he was ready. So it was very private. And uh, this particular blog gives people an opportunity. Many people from Dave's church go to that blog every day. They read about what he's up to, what he says, what other people are saying about it that maybe they hadn't thought about. And it, it's part of their process of maybe walking away from it in time before it's too late. Is this because I think it's, go ahead. Is that where you posted uh, the videos that I made about PAC? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, the blog, the, the fellow that runs the blog found you by accident. And he's, he's not a real friend of Dave's either. And he put one of yours up. And when I, when I got into them, um, they were just so well done that I put the rest of them up. Uh, and, and they caused all sorts of problems. You know, it's just the, the comments. It's amazing to me how people just cannot think or won't allow themselves to think. It's too scary. Okay, so now now we're talking about you know something with me personally. I, I haven't seen any of the comments on the blog that you're talking about. So give me an idea. Mm -hmm. What what is the what is the reaction there? You well, it's, people afraid to think. Give me an yeah. Idea. It, well, um, you know, for example, we put. Uh, um, some comments about Noah's Ark, you know, some of the classic, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the ones was that, you know, history shows that civilizations are seamlessly linked through the time when the earth was supposed to be flooded and only eight people survived, you know. So they, they put that up on the site and um, the justifications uh, of how God could have done this or God could have done that um, with scientific type things, rather than address the questions like that you address so so well, um, people will just simply um, go into denial over them or start attacking the messenger type of a thing. You know, I've I've had that happen quite often when somebody can't answer the question or won't answer the question, then they'll take a pot shot at me from being a church pastor. You know, you're one of them. You're just using your power, which. I never had any power, you know, yeah, well, so it's very I've also, interesting. I've also noticed that tendency that people have where if they can't attack you on the point that you're making and they can't concede that point either, they have to come up with any other excuse. And in some cases, they're even trained to 
put you off your feet by making some kind of peripheral accusation that had nothing to do with what you were just talking about. Like, I think it was the, the Scientologist that would immediately accuse you of being a child molester. That exactly. they, had to put, they had to put you on the offensive. And this is, this is a great way to change the subject for a sub because they know they can't deal with the subject yeah. that you're actually talking about. There's no way to refute it, and neither can they accept the reality of well, what you're saying. With one of the th things I found in the ministry um, is that people expect the minister to be perfect, you know, to have his act together, to be perfect and be unlike members, you know, members who can do whatever they want and whatever they do, you have to forgive them. And so it's very easy for these people um, to deflect by picking on a minister's weakness or something in the past or, or whatever and say, well, you know, didn't you once say or didn't this happen and, and they get completely off the topic and it becomes kind of a personal attack and then somehow they feel better about that like you never answered the question yeah um, i've noticed that, that there there are some things you can say within the united states to uh, two other americans that don't seem to have any effect on, unless you go outside the u.s and tell people outside the u.s things about what's going on in this country then people get upset why are you telling us it's, it's not like you know there's there's secret information it's not like they couldn't already know anyway right. but in this case the reason i bring that up is because obviously this video is going to be posted on your blog i would expect uh since mm -hmm. you're, you're representing yourself here so you're talking to the people that are in your blog that are also in dave's church and at the same time you're talking to a wider audience that that to, to people that are not on that blog. So you'd be talking about that church to people outside that church and also inside that church. Is there, is there a, a, a message that you would like to impart to these people in that sense? What yes, well, like I would just, yeah, I would just say that all of these splinters from the Worldwide Church of God uh, have kind of boiled down to three or four major ones with leaders who, to me, just to my perspective, are uh, certainly have some personality issues. I have found over the years that a man, <clears throat> a minister with mental health issues can hide very easily in the ministry because his quirkiness or his demanding personality or his bullying seems like obedience, seems like some kind of righteousness. Now you couldn't do that at IBM. You couldn't do that at any company that you'd be fired. But, um, and then there's the, the give me your money sell your house it's, it's extreme because the whole point is they think jesus is about to return any minute so you don't need it anyway it needs to be for god's work which of course is what they represent in their minds um many we people seen, we have seen that that, that that religious organizations are very good at cloaking uh mental uh mental conditions certain mental conditions i mean you can right. have a schizophrenic disorder I say can have, but yeah, you can have a certain certain maladies such as this, and get along just fine in the church environment at in certain positions, especially in leadership positions. That's right. Enough. That's right. Well, and I've written too that I you look back in in the in the Old Testament. Uh, I'm convinced, you know, that the the people that were honored, like the Isaiahs, Jeremiahs, Amos, Ezekiel types, if you just look at what they did. What they said, they heard voices in their head, they cooked food in their own dung, they laid siege to a frying pan, <laughs> you know, they do all of these things that today we'd say, that's some serious mental illness. You know, even Paul's Damascus Road experience has all the classic symptoms, and I'm not sure it ever happened, I'm pretty sure it didn't, but at least not that way, but he has all the classic symptoms of temporal lobe epilepsy you know, bright lights that only he sees, voices that only he hears. Um, so I often wonder how much of religion itself is born from people who behave strangely and can get away with it in religion where you couldn't in, in public. Well, I've often said that some aspects of religion could likely be cured with Thorazine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then the other thing that religion does, it, does, it doesn't just, not at the higher, not just at the higher ups, but also the, the, the parishioners, you know, it, that religion can easily mask and enable uh, a re religious or, or uh, mental conditions and uh, abuses and so forth. Um, there can be all kinds of maladies that will never be discovered that will seem to, that will actually be enhanced and encourage encouraged. Encouraged. Yeah, yes. in certain religious groups. But yeah. then you also have the abuses that you mentioned because the authoritarian 
dictates this kind of a structure, as you said, it doesn't work in IBM and other places, but in a church, this kind of abuse can easily get by. And how often do we hear about yet another pastor who's arrested for a sex scandal, uh, often involving children and, and, and anybody weaker than him? Right. Anybody weaker. That's exactly right. And it, it is um, backed up. Uh, you know, you can make bold claims that are personality disorder based and then go find a scripture of somebody in the Bible who acted and said the same thing. And all of a sudden, well, it's in the Bible, so maybe it's okay, you know. Um, going back to the, the blog site, one of the benefits of that is, and even to your series where you basically took Dave's creationism series apart, that's forever more on the Internet. And people who in the future get caught up in some of these things or hear the programs from the church and see kind of the schmooze and the shtick that goes with it, also have an alternative to, to look up things and say, oh, well, this is also going on, or this is what people who used to be in those churches say about it. Maybe I should be much more careful. Because when I came in the church uh, back in the 60s, Garner Ted Armstrong was on the radio around the world, but there was no mechanism to question what he was saying. Um, you know, Dave Pack was very foolish to go online in this day and age and declare, you know, his, his truth of creationism using outdated material and sounding like he thought it up himself, which he didn't, with somebody like yourself and many others who are out there just waiting to say, no, nothing you have said is true, and here's why. That didn't exist back when I came into the ministry. Well, uh, and that's what the benefit is today, that these things are out there. People have the dark side that they can look at and decide whether to go forward. Yeah, now, now, just being able to criticize someone for what they said is no special talent. Everybody can do that. Uh, but you, you're right about a couple of things that you said about Pack. His, his methods and his material are way outdated. It's like the guy still lives in the 1950s. Well, that's what he said. Yeah, you know, he, he learned 50 years ago that evolution was false. I was in that class. I know what he's talking about, and that was the most bogus class that you could possibly take. Do you? Um, you, you know what he's referring to. Oh, absolutely. Uh, when he said in the video, you know, I learned evolution was not true 50 years ago. Um, I said, you know, second year Bible class, Genesis Flood, Morris and Whitcomb, bogus book. But that's what the church used to show that the Bible was literally true and, and all of that. So but that's is, the uh, only source of his education that he has. I'll guarantee you he's never read another book outside of that book. Well, he's very clearly never read any sort of actual science book. That's true. No, no. He's made that very obvious. But he said that he studied the evolution versus creationism con con controversy in depth for two and a half years. What? Right. That, that gave me pause. I thought, no, you didn't. You had two and a half more years of ambassador to college to go. Uh, when he referred to the archer fish yeah. um, and anableps, I thought, oh, my gosh, you know. It's those were the two examples used 50 years ago in that class. The church had a publication called A Whale of a Tale, where Garner Ted Armstrong showed that whales couldn't have evolved, which of course is a real mistake today. Yeah. Um, and then a theory for the birds. And but two of the examples in that 50 year old literature were the archer fish and anablips. And when he said that, I thought, oh my gosh, you haven't read a thing in 50 years. Well, that's what makes it such a such an amusing series. He he yeah. is he trots out all of the points refuted a thousand <laughs> times, all the classics, you know. The, yeah, so all, you, all the classics, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and he has no idea that these were disproved, as you say, fifty years ago. And 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 where? Why has he not done anything to try to catch up? Well, somebody <laughs> somebody suggested that I should have a debate with this guy, and I know that that would never oh, he won't happen. Debate you. He yeah. won't do it. No, because <laughs> I've offered to debate him on on religion. I, I published a public letter on the blog site, you know, a, a challenge or a, a request to debate Dave. He won't do it. He won't come out of his castle. He will not do it. Um, yeah. He's king of his castle, but outside of it, he wouldn't stand a chance. Um, and he so, seems to know that. Oh, he does know that. I'm sure he does know that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's... Um, uh, 
uh, yeah, that 50 year thing, um, I knew exactly what he was talking about. And it was, I would say shallow would not even begin to describe his in-depth study. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that because that was one thing I, I had no idea what to what he could be referring to. With this, to but I mean, but the, the, the ultimate. I mean, the, the symptom is he came out of it not knowing anything, and not just right. not knowing anything about the specific thing that he's talking about. But I mean, for like everything he said is wrong. You know, just like, <laughs> I know. I know. yeah. Well, that's what I liked your cutaways, where you would stare into the camera and just say everything you just said is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I, I didn't want to talk about myself and all of this. I am I am okay. wanting to, but you know, but you, you did highlight a couple of things that I was curious about that I didn't know. So, uh, where do you go from here? I mean, you got you got this blog going on, and what are the you, you used to have some kind of community interaction, albeit uh, in secret? Uh, um, no, no. I mean, I actually you know have another life. Um, I am always torn between letting it go, being done with it. You know, living my life daily in the present, enjoying things, and then kind of getting sucked back into it because I do have a background that I think can be helpful to people. I have people write me quietly, you know, don't tell anybody, but, you know, you've really helped me or can you help me with this or that. Um, but I get torn between do I want to soak in it the rest of my life because I don't see many people who change. I don't, you know, and it's almost like by this time, uh, you haven't seen the light with some of these people. I can't help you, and and living a life that's satisfying to me, mm -hmm. uh, you know that because well, I I, I'm the, not. I have the but, advantage over you in that in that I do see people change. Of course, I'm not coming from a super fundamentalist group. Like that's the thing. Them. Yeah, yeah, it's not a light group of people who give up things easily. Um, they've invested invested a lot and to walk away i mean physically invested a lot to walk away from it um is is a loss beyond compare you know there have been any number of suicides um in the churches because of people who just couldn't leave couldn't stay were criticized for this or that didn't know how to handle it you know um yeah i i, I can I can empathize with you know, the, the constant criticism. They, 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 there's no way that you can renounce and pretend, and yet they own the community. And and it's like there's a passage in the Bible that talks about how you know uh, Jewish slaves could be released, and so the excuse is that they're not really slaves because they can be released. But if you release the slave, but you own his family, mm -hmm. the slave's not going to yeah. leave. Well, and there's one one of the splinter groups. It's called the Philadelphia Church of God. They, one of their main teachings is that if you're a member of that particular church, you are not to have contact with your family members who aren't. That's caused people to commit suicide. Um, and yet the people obey it. it it's just incredible to me yeah, that uh, they will do that and put that kind of a church ahead of their family. I mean, they'll cut their children off. They won't see them. They won't talk to them because they're not in that church. That's insanity. Well, again, it, and we mentioned literally that it is insanity by some degrees. I mean, the, the delusion, certainly, uh, by definition, uh, you know, where you have a fixed fake or fixed false belief that will not change despite evidence to the contrary. You know, so that is certainly delusional, even if it's not uh, caused by a pathogen of some kind, it still qualifies as as delusional. And it's it's also you know, like thought police, these are mind crimes. You're not allowed to think or believe outside of what we tell you to think or believe, which is insidious. Mm -hmm. And when people ask well, me, a lot of, a lot of people are, we're not, a, uh, we're not aware of PAC and then, and you know, cause there's many other high profile, you know, uh, people that are out on the web. And so when I started doing this series on him, they're like, well, who is this guy? Why does he matter? Well, it's not right. necessarily that he does, but you have to understand one, he does own this this tiny little empire of his, and his, as you said, is only one of hundreds of splinter groups where they own the whole community, and nobody gets to see or hear any outside information except by avenues like what you provide. Right, right, yeah, and, and it's uh, you know, it's in Dave Pack's mind, he is the greatest work on the face of the earth for God. He has the most amazing website. He has the largest theological website, which he doesn't, 
but you know when you see him and hear him talking his his uh, superlatives about himself about his work about his impact doesn't match reality that's why i think you know we're talking about some personality disorders narcissism um very well, self-absorbed yeah. thinking you know and that's a very common trait in a lot of these uh, cultic one-man shows that I've seen is, is the classic narcissist who can rise to the top, sometimes in business, sometimes in politics, but certainly in religion, on the backs of others who don't seem to mind it. They don't mind that he abuses them. Well, it, it, we, again, we have two different schools of thought here. We have, for what I prefer, is uh, people that, that uh, it's a meritocracy. You know, the, the, val the only value information can have is how accurate you can show it to be. And if you can't show that your information is accurate at all, then it has no value at all. But there are other people, there are other, so it doesn't matter what you tell me about Jesus's love for me and everything. If you can't show that what you're talking about is actually real, yep, there's nothing. There's just no impact or importance to what you're saying. That's but right. for other people, all that matters is your, your air of confidence. You just have to be confident about what you say. And then it doesn't matter if what you say is actually true. And I'm thinking this is Dunning Kruger. This is you know, Dunning Kruger is the uh, is is a is a a study that that revealed that the less somebody knows about something, the more they think they know about it. Or the oh, high, yes. the high that they would the higher they would rate their aptitude in things they know nothing about. Right. So, so religion is 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 this? It's this Dunning Kruger effect. Was, oh, I don't know. Therefore, I know. <laughs> That's right. I don't know. And if I and if I say it loudly, um, and read some scriptures that you know seem to back this up, um, there I got gotcha, you. You know, yeah. it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. I've I've always kidded about you know the great uh, put downs of the Bible that when when all else fails, when uh, somebody doesn't know how to answer you, the answers are. Well, my ways are not your ways. Well, the wisdom of man is foolishness with God. Or there is a way that seems right to you, but it's going to end in your death. Those are the great disclaimers that... Professing you, to be some, wise, they right, became fools. Became fools <laughs> yeah. and by, the time, by the time somebody throws that at you, you know they've run out of ideas to answer the question. Yeah. Well, usually their first result, first resort, is to say, "The fool saith in his heart, there is no God." That's right. Yeah. That's <laughs> and then, right. I, and then I move right to, to immediately after that, where it also says that there is of, of the atheists that says that there is none who do good, not even one. And I say, okay, well, how many, how many, how many different ways do we need to disprove this absolute statement? That we just made? <laughs> not even one. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it doesn't say that they, you know, there was none who only do good. No, no, it says so. Anybody does a good thing, then already that that disproves that absolute statement. Well, now now you have to go back. There's another scripture that says all of your righteousness is as filthy rags. Yep, yep. So you see, you know, you may you just think you're doing good, but this only backs up another argument that I make because people say that there's a there's a moral judgment. You know that that the reason that they are good is because God wants them to be good, and I have to argue that. You know, your God, according to the scripture, isn't doesn't care if you're good or not. All sins will be forgiven if you but believe. And if you don't believe, then that won't be forgiven. Because the sin that won't be forgiven is the sin is dip, disbelief. So gullibility is the only criteria for redemption. And that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and they argue that that's not the case. And I'm like, okay, well, there's never a situation where a good and righteous charitable person who does not believe could get into heaven, but there's every situation where the, the filthiest sinner can get in. All he That's has right. to do is breathe, oh, save me, Jesus, as he's dying. Oh, he's all good. It doesn't matter what happened. Uh -huh. that. <laughs> uh -huh. I loved uh, a sign that somebody, I went past it in Kentucky, London and Somerset, Kentucky, and uh, just outside of town, there was a barn that had a sign on it that said, love Jesus or burn forever in hell. Yeah. And I used that in a sermon. I said that that's not unlike telling your children, give daddy a hug or I'll kill you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it's, it, and this is also presented as a moral choice, as if you right. had a choice, right? That's right. So that's somebody, right. Gun to your head. You have a choice. You can do what I ask you to. It's your choice. Right. Or you can die. <laughs> or, you, or you can burn forever. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Dennis, did you have... We're gonna we're closing up here, or we're getting uh, pretty close to the end of this. Okay. So I'm gonna ask, do you have anything else that you would that do you want to impart 
to anybody that might be watching this outside of your your own sphere of your of your, the normal audience that you would address what would you like to, to say about yourself yeah, that maybe we haven't covered yet well i just like to say that um we live in a time when the information is available to anybody on the questions you know the bible is is revered it's called the greatest book ever written which it isn't but um um and religion is actually seemingly uh, falling you know in disrespect these days much more than when i was a kid growing up it was kind of the other way but the information is available to an honest mind who wants to know the answers to where did the bible come from what are the contradictions who really wrote it why did they write it because if you get involved with a cultic leader or a one-man church or a mega church pastor that person's going to tell you how to live they're going to tell you where to be how much to give what you're going to believe you know one of the scriptures in the in, that paul came up with he said we need to all speak the same thing so there be no divisions that's not a reason to speak the same thing that's just a reason to have harmony based in error and uh um i would like people to realize that um there's so much more information available to them that uh, uh they can avail themselves to if i had the internet you know when i was a kid you asked the pastor what your questions were and he gave you the denominational spin and i thought that was the answer i didn't know there were other ways of looking at things and so i would hope that people um, who are interested in religion or who are emotionally involved with religion would just learn also to critically think so that they don't get hurt. And the people I know, the mega pastors, the cultic leaders, the splinter groups, they hurt people. They hurt them financially, they hurt them morally, they hurt them intellectually, and uh, all of that is unnecessary if you have a mind that's open to question these people and not let them tell you how it all is, but find out how it all is yourself. We, there's no excuse not to learn what you want to learn today um, from sources other than people just telling you, well, this is what you have to believe. So uh, I, I, I try to be positive about things. I don't like to pick on people individually. Um, I assume Dave Pack is sincere, but he's stuck in a time warp and I believe there are some personality problems, which I see in many ministers, uh, as we talked about, uh, who can get away with it to the harm of, of their congregants, uh, who for some reason need to stay put, but really need to leave uh, to preserve their, their, their thinking and, and even their income and their families. Um, you're gonna always have these kind of people around I don't question their motives. Some of them are more obviously shysters than others. Uh, some believe their press, some don't. I've met both kinds. Um, some treat it as a business and some treat it as a calling. Uh, I find those who, like Dave Pack, who sees himself spoken of in the scriptures, he literally sees himself as the Joshua of the book of Haggai and, and many other crazy ideas about himself in scripture. This is not a harmless person. This is somebody uh, that may harken back and sometimes in our life to the Jim Jones approach to theology, you know. Um, so, as I say, I'm a little torn between moving on with my own life and being fascinated by how these people think, how they reason, and fascinated by the people who follow them. Why do you do that? Like you've said in your, in your videos, I don't care what you believe. I want to know why you believe that. How did you come to that conclusion? And most people can't even explain that. They just believe it. Yeah, that, that is a common one. And, and for the people who more uh, would be more inclined to seek help from your expertise than mine, uh, I will be happy to put a, a link to your blog uh, here and any other information that you, you know, for people who would be interested in contacting you, who understand their situation from one of these many splitter groups or, or Dave Pack's particular one, uh, and, and, and maybe they're not aware of your blog yet or, or what have you. 
uh, I'll put information and anything that you, you wanted to add to how to contact you if you're into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's on that site, that particular site. And as I say, the, um, the blog, there's a blog owner and then uh, several years ago when he understood who I was, and he came from the same background, um, invited me to write extensively on his site. And, and to date, I'm the only pastor who writes under my real name and comments under my real name because I, I would like to help people. But I also I have to be true to myself. You know, I spent a lot of years, uh, a lot of years in hindsight, doing what I was told, believing what I was told to believe and hoping for the best. And um, I'm going to take charge of my life uh, myself. <laughs> so that's where I am right now. Well, I hope for you it's not a thankless position. I mean, you do get positive feedback, do you not? Um, I do. I do. I, what, what I find, yes, there's pretty good balance. Um, those who go after you, you know, pick on some of the most ridiculous things. Um, but, I, and that's been good for me too, because I'm, rather sensitive person. I think that's how I ended up in the ministry. I'm a caretaker at heart. I have a career right now where I'm a caretaker at heart. Uh, I'm not a politician, you know, I'm not a business guy. Uh, these people intrigue me as long as I don't have to be around them or under them or do anything they say. All right. Well, very good. Dennis Steele, uh, it, thank you for sharing uh, everything that you've, that you've shared here. And I will, as I said, I would be happy to, uh, to put your, your, link in there for your blog have people check that out uh, do please check out dennis deal's blog on this and especially if you are with one of these churches even if you don't agree with him necessarily or with me at least check out why you don't agree with either of us and mr deal thank you very much for being on thank you so much i really enjoyed this